Hi, I'm Miss Ginsburg with No Adam, and today we're going to be reading Rocky Shores. This is a lab manual in Unit 6. Section 1, Studying Ecosystems, Muscle Glue. Blue mussels are a common sight on rocks on many coastlines. They remain in place even as waves crash into the shore over and over again. A shore is the place where land and water meet. Scientists and engineers are fascinated by how blue mussels can survive the force of the waves. They have studied them looking for clues about how they are able to stick so firmly to the rocks as the waves crash over them. Scientists have learned that blue mussels make adhesives just as strong as human glue. They produce thin, bungee-like, silky fibers called bisel threads. They anchor themselves to rocks with these threads. Bisel threads begin as a sticky mixture of proteins and other substances. The sticky adhesive mixture hardens. It turns into strong and flexible threads that keep the muscles attached to the rocks. An adaptation at risk. This ability to produce bisel threads is an adaptation. It helps the mussels survive the harsh conditions of their environment. When the waves pound the rocks, the bisel threads help to anchor the blue mussels so they don't get swept out to sea. Recently, scientists have said they are concerned that climate change will make it harder for the blue mussel to attach firmly to rocks. A group of scientists announced in 2013 that the bisel threads became weaker when water temperatures are seven degrees Celsius or 15 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than typical summer temperatures. Blue mussels attach themselves to rocks so they don't get swept away by the waves. A connected ecosystem. Scientists worry about what will happen to the rocky shore ecosystem if the blue mussels become less able to survive. An ecosystem is a community of different species that depend on interacting with each other and their physical environment for survival. All ecosystems, including living things. All ecosystems include living things. They also include oxygen and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, water, and energy from the sun. Blue mussels play several important roles in many rocky shore ecosystems. First, blue mussels are filter feeders. Filter feeders are marine animals with organs that gather energy by straining nutrients and small organisms out of the water. As they strain food out of the water, they also remove sediment, heavy metals, and toxins from the water. This process cleans the water. Another role of blue mussels is to provide a habitat for other living things. This is because blue mussels often form large mussel beds attaching to other mussels. Many different kinds of organisms live on or in between the mussels. A third role of the blue mussel is as food for other living things. Remember that an important life function of all living things is getting energy from food. Blue mussels get food by filtering other organisms from the water. Blue mussels are also an important food source for many organisms in the rocky shore ecosystem, including sea stars, fish, birds, and humans. The rocky shore is an ecosystem. All ecosystems are made up of both living and non-living things. Relationships among living things. If blue mussels were to decrease in numbers, scientists worry that many organisms in the rocky shore ecosystem might be harmed. This is because any population of organisms depends on different resources for survival. A population is all of the members of a species within a particular area. Resources include food, space, and water. We can look at the predator-prey relationship to see how the resource of food affects different organisms. Predators are organisms that eat other organisms for energy. Prey are organisms that get eaten by predators. Every ecosystem has predators and prey. If a population of blue mussels suddenly decreased, the predators of the mussels would have to compete for fewer food sources. Competition happens in ecosystems whenever two or more organisms require the same limited resource. Organisms primarily compete for food and space, which is extremely limited in a rocky shore ecosystem. 
When one food source decreases, the competition among predators often increases because food is essential for survival. Not all interactions among organisms are driven by the search for food, however. Remember that a driving force behind all life is the urge to reproduce and pass along genes to future offspring. We can see an example of this in one species of fish. Scientists have long believed that mussels and a tiny fish called the European bitterling had a mutually beneficial relationship. This kind of relationship happens when both species get a survival advantage by working with one another. Scientists observed that, male, um, that female bitterlings lay their eggs inside the mussel. They were protected there until the eggs hatched and swam away. In return, scientists thought the larvae of the mussels could attach to the fish and be carried to new locations where they could grow and develop. This sea star is eating a mussel. The relationship between mussels and bitterlings has been used in many textbooks and encyclopedias as an example of a mutual, mutually beneficial relationship. However, a scientist named Dr. Carl Smith wanted to learn more about how the bitterlings reproduce. He began to study female bitterlings as they laid their eggs. He made a surprising discovery. He saw that many female bitterlings lay their eggs in the same muscle. This resulted in some muscles having hundreds of bitterlings eggs. This wasn't beneficial to the mussel. Dr. Smith observed that the mussels often stopped growing because they were so overloaded with eggs. Other studies have shown that the bitterling doesn't even carry the mussel larvae to new locations. These findings tell scientists that the mussel bitterling relationship is not mutually beneficial at all. Instead, it is parasitic. Parasitic relationships occur when one organism, the parasite, is dependent on another living organism, the parasite's host. The parasite survives by taking the host's nutrients. A balanced ecosystem. As these different interactions show, living things depend on other living things for survival. As organisms interact with one another to carry out their life functions, they act as checks on one another. They balance the population size so no one population grows so much that it drives out other living things. We can understand this by looking at interactions between sea stars and mussels. Experiments have shown that when sea star predators are removed from an ecosystem, the population of mussels explodes. Mussels move farther down in the intertidal zone, smothering the native seaweed. The intertidal zone is the region of land that is covered and uncovered by water between high and low tides. Therefore, the presence of sea stars acts as a natural check on the population growth of the mussels. Here's a picture of a bitterling fish. The flow of energy on a rocky shore. Many organisms would be unable to survive if sea stars were removed and blue mussels smothered the native seaweed. This is because the seaweed is an essential source of energy for organisms that eat the seaweed. It is also important for the entire rocky shore food web. A food web is a visual that shows the network of food chains in an ecosystem. Food chains show specific paths that energy travels as one organism eats another. All energy in a food web begins with the sun. As the sun shines, it produces light energy. Organisms called producers capture energy directly from the sun to make their own food. Phytoplankton, seaweed, and algae are common producers in a rocky shore food web. They carry out a process called photosynthesis. In photosynthesis, producers turn sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide into oxygen and a sugar called glucose that holds chemical energy. Producers always make up the first level of any food web. They are the link between the energy source, the sun, and the rest of the organisms that live in the ecosystem. Consumers in a food web. The next level of a food web are made up of consumers. Consumers are organisms that eat other organisms for energy. All predators are consumers. Consumers can be herbivores, animals that eat only plants, carnivores, animals that eat other animals, or herbivores, animals that eat plants and other animals. There are three different levels of consumer. 
The second level of a food web is a kind of consumer called a primary consumer. They are the first organisms that get energy by eating producers. Many primary consumers are herbivores. In the rocky shore food web, mussels are primary consumers. Zooplankton and limpets are as well. Seaweed are producers. The third level of organisms in a food web consists of secondary consumers. Secondary consumers eat the primary consumers. The mud crab is a secondary consumer because it eats mussels, which eat algae. In some food chains, there is a fourth level. The fourth level is made up of tertiary consumers that eat secondary consumers. Sea stars are tertiary consumers because they eat whelks, which eat limpets, which eat phytoplankton. Decomposers are their own level in a food web. Decomposers are organisms that break down organic waste and feed on the nutrients. When decomposers feed on the nutrients, they also access some of the energy that is stored in the organic matter. As organic matter decomposes, the nutrients within it, including nitrogen and carbon, are recycled back into the environment. The arrows show how energy flows in a food web. In organisms, as organisms interact with one another and their environment, energy flows throughout the ecosystem. For example, during photosynthesis, producers turn the sun's energy along with water and carbon dioxide into oxygen and glucose. Glucose is food for the plant. It stores chemical energy, which producers need to grow. Plants use 90% of the energy to perform all of their life functions. They store the remaining 10% in extra glucose in their leaves and other parts. When organisms eat one another, that energy gets passed along. However, since primary consumers only get 10% of the energy, they must eat more plants to get enough energy to perform all of their life functions. When a secondary consumer eats a primary consumer, only 10% of this energy gets passed along. Because of the decreasing amount of available energy as you move up a food web, there are fewer organisms at the top of a food chain than at the bottom. Energy gets passed along in the form of chemical bonds holding together the molecules of glucose. Each cell in every living thing takes the glucose and performs a process called cellular respiration. Cellular respiration takes place in cells' mitochondria. Cellular respiration, respiration uses oxygen to break down the glucose and store it store its energy in molecules of ATP. ATP is the molecule that powers life. In addition to ATP, cellular respiration also produces heat as a byproduct. The cycling of matter on a rocky shore. Unlike energy, matter cycles through ecosystems. Most of the matter on Earth today has been around since the planet first formed. Over the years, all of the molecules that make up all of matter, including carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, have been broken down and transformed as they move through food webs. Matter is transferred and recycled at every level of a food web. For example, photosynthesis and cellular respiration cycle oxygen and carbon dioxide through the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, carbon bonds with oxygen. This forms carbon dioxide. When plants take in carbon dioxide to perform photosynthesis, some of the carbon atoms are used for growth. These atoms become part of the plant. Animals that eat plants absorb those carbon atoms. When plants and animals die, decomposers break down the carbon atom and return them to the environment. The oxygen cycle is closely connected to the carbon cycle. The oxygen cycle is a back and forth exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between plants, animals, and the environment. When animals breathe in, they absorb oxygen molecules from the air. Those molecules are used in cellular respiration. When organisms eat other organisms, they also absorb nutrients that their bodies use as building materials for growth and development. When organisms die, decomposers return those nutrients back to the soil. Plants can absorb them for their own growth and development. Resilience of ecosystems. 
One group of scientists studied one particular rocky shore food web. They observed that the population of blue mussels along the Gulf of Maine coastline has declined by more than 60% over the past 40 years. This area extends from Cape Cod north to the Canadian border. One study found that blue mussels used to cover as much as two thirds of the intertidal zone. Now they cover less than 15%. The research is ongoing as to what has caused this decrease in blue mussels and what can be done about it. The scientists want to continue monitoring the stress levels and death rates of the blue mussels. They have a database on the numbers of the blue mussel populations in the area. This information is important for understanding the health of the ecosystem. It is also important for many commercial fishermen who depend on the mussels for their livelihood. Ecology. These scientists are ecologists. Ecology is the study of living things in their natural environment. Ecologists research where organisms are found in ecosystems, the relationships with one another, and the interactions between energy and life. Part of the challenge of ecology is collecting data about the different organisms that live on the shore. It is impossible to count every mussel and seaweed, so scientists take sample observations using quadrant survey squares. By spacing out the surveys at set distances, examples three meters, six meters, it is possible to take an unbiased organism survey. Scientists hope that by gathering data on population changes within the food web, they will be better able to understand what is causing these changes. These scientists are taking a quadrant survey. Ecosystem disturbances. Any event that changes conditions in an ecosystem is called a disturbance. Disturbances can be gradual or sudden. They can be caused by natural events or by humans. Sudden disruptions can harm the ecosystem. Anything that can cause harm to an ecosystem is called an environmental threat. Fires, floods, volcanic eruptions, and extreme weather such as drought and tornadoes are all disturbances that can lead to shifts of resources within an ecosystem, as well as the populations of organisms that make up the ecosystem. Humans pose a particular environmental threat. About 40% of human activity takes place near the shoreline. The most visible human impact on rocky shores is pollution. Pollution occurs when waste, chemicals, or other harmful substances contaminate the environment. Pesticides, drugs, oil, and human waste regularly wash out to sea. These pollutants make it harder for intertidal organisms to function, grow, and reproduce. Pollution also impacts humans who depend on many of the species of the rocky shore for food and income. Because of the importance of rocky shore ecosystems, people have put in place conservation efforts to protect it. Conservation is the weighing of human needs against the needs of the environment to create a sustainable way for humans to live off of natural resources. Pollution harms ecosystems. This photograph shows oil covering the water. Section two, adapting to the rocky shore, eating habits of sea stars. When a sea star gets ready to eat a shelled animal like a mussel, it does something unlike almost any other animal on earth. Remember that sea stars are predatory animals with five or more rays, arms, extending from a central disc. First, it has hundreds of tiny suction cupped tube feet that cling to surfaces. Tube feet are small tubes on the mouth side of sea stars. These feet make a glue. The glue allows the sea star to attach its feet to the outside of the shell. It then forces the shell apart. Then comes the really unusual part. It pushes one of its stomachs, called the cardiac stomach, outside of its own body and into the shell. The cardiac stomach then digests the animal inside the shell. This turns the animal's remains into a soupy mixture. The stomach then brings the food back into the sea star. The food is digested more by the sea star's second stomach, 
called the pyloric stomach. Adapting to the rocky shore. This ability to eat shelled prey, such as mussels, is an adaptation that allows sea stars to eat prey much larger than the sea star's mouth. Remember that those organisms that have useful adaptations are more likely to survive and pass along their genes to future offspring. Those organisms that cannot adapt to their environment don't reproduce and die out over time. Sea stars are one of the most successful animals on the rocky shore. They have adapted to withstand the rushing waves by producing the glue that attaches them to rocks and other surfaces. However, unlike the glue made by mussels, the glue made by sea stars is reversible. They can still move around when looking for food. Sea star adaptations. Sea stars also use their feet and a water vascular system to move. The water vascular system is a series of three water-filled canals, a stone canal, a ring canal, and a radial canal, or central disc. The sea star's tube feet can fill with water. By moving water from the vascular system to the feet, the sea star can make a foot move. This process allows the sea stars to move toward their prey at speeds of up to 1.5 meters per minute. Water enters the vascular system through a sieve plate. This is an entrance for water into a sea star's body. Sea stars also have adaptations that help them survive predation. Just as they are predators of many organisms in the rocky shore, they are also prey for various organisms, including many kinds of birds and fish. To help defend them, sea stars have spines. Spines are sharp extensions made of calcium that coat the top of a sea star's rays or arms. Sea stars have different structures that help them survive in their environment. How sea stars reproduce. Because sea stars cannot move very quickly, they cannot very often escape predators. Another adaptation that many kinds of sea stars have is the ability to regenerate their bodies when necessary. They do this through the process of fragmentation. Fragmentation is a form of asexual reproduction. A new individual develops from a part of a parent that broke off and forms a complete new organism. Sea stars are able to do this because most of their vital organs are found in their arms. The ability to regenerate is a useful adaptation in the Harst Rothke Shore ecosystem. Scientists are still trying to figure out exactly how sea stars are able to regrow new limbs and sometimes entire bodies. Sexual reproduction. Sea stars can only reproduce sexually through spawning. Spawning happens when males release sperm and females release eggs into the environment. To help ensure that the sperm and the eggs will find each other, sea stars gather in groups. Organs in the male's arm fill with sperm. Organs in the female's arm fill with eggs. When it's time to spawn, males and females release large numbers of sperm and eggs into the water. Some female sea stars release millions of eggs into the water. When an egg combines with a sperm, it forms an embryo. The fertilized embryos are free swimming animals that turn into adult sea stars. These reproductive behaviors help sea stars pass along their genetic information to future generations. This ensures that their species will continue and not die out. Sea stars reproduce asexually through fragmentation. A sea star's adaptations the adaptations, and how it helps the sea star survive. Regeneration. Regrows rays or organs if harmed. Spines. Protects from predators. Eye spot at the end of each ray. Detects the presence of light and dark. Tube feet. Small tubes on the mouth side of sea stars. Allow for movement attached to surfaces in strong waves, capture prey and pry open shells, attached to rocks to hide from predators. Water vascular system, a series of water-filled canals. Movement and feeding. Stomach that extends outside the body. 
feeding on prey larger than the mouth. Section three, environmental stresses. Life on a rocky shore. Rocky shores have been called natural laboratories because scientists can conduct experiments that would be almost impossible anywhere else. For example, scientists have learned a lot of what they know about competitive interactions among organisms from studying rocky shore environments. Rocky shores are also home to some of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. This is true for several reasons. One reason is that rocky shores have many kinds of habitats. They have steep rocky cliffs, platforms, and tide pools. Tide pools are pools of salt water left behind by receding tide. The water along the shore is also rich in nutrients. As the wind blows against the surface of the water, water from below the surface rises to take its place. This deep seawater is filled with the plankton and minerals needed by filter feeders and algae to grow. However, life on the rocky shores is also harsh. Organisms must be able to tolerate a high level of environmental stress. Stress is any factor that reduces an organism's ability to survive. Organisms that live on rocky shores must be able to adapt to constant changes in their environment. During some portion of the day, it is covered in water. At other times, it is exposed to air and heat from the sun. This change happens because of the constant movement of the tides and the powerful crashing of waves on the shore. Rocky shores are diverse ecosystems made up of many different kinds of organisms. The role of tides on rocky shores. Tides are a major cause of the different environmental stresses on rocky shores. Tides are the alternating rising and falling of the sea with respect to the land. To understand why tides happens, happen begins with the understanding of Earth's position in space. Tides result from two oceanic bulges, one on either side of the planet. These bulges are caused by two forces, gravity and inertia. Remember that gravity is an attractive force produced by all matter. The sun is the most massive object in our solar system. Its gravity is so strong that it holds all of the planets, as well as non-planetary objects, in its orbit. However, the strength of gravitational force decreases quickly with distance. Here on Earth, Earth's gravity is the dominant force. Most things on Earth stay rooted to the surface because of Earth's gravity. However, because oceans are liquid, they respond to gravity more dramatically than solid land does. As a result, the moon's gravity pulls oceans toward it. The sun's gravity impacts the tides as well, but with much less force than the moon. Every object in the universe attracts every other object with its gravity. The moon's gravity plays an important role in the movement of tides. The sun's gravity plays a lesser role. It is often said that the moon orbits Earth However, this is not entirely true. Together, the moon and earth form a system that has the combined mass of the moon and earth. As the moon orbits earth, it and earth are actually orbiting around a center of mass. To understand this, remember that all matter has a center of mass. Take a ruler and balance it on your finger. The point on the ruler where it balances is its center of mass. But the center of mass is not always in the middle of an object. Try to balance a hammer on your finger. Your finger will have to be much closer to the heavier part of the hammer. The Earth-Moon system is similar to the hammer. Because Earth has a much greater mass than the Moon, the Earth-Moon system's center of mass is on the side of Earth closest to the Moon. If you were to spin the hammer around, it would spin around its center of mass. In the same way, Earth and the moon spin around their system's center of mass. That spinning motion causes inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object at rest to stay at rest, and an object in motion to stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. Simply put, 
objects tend to keep moving or remain still unless they encounter force. As Earth spins, the oceans move with it. Inertia causes the oceans to attempt to keep moving in a straight line away from the Earth-Moon system center of mass, in the same way your arms want to move away from your body when you spin around quickly. Because the center of mass is on the side of Earth closest to the moon, water bulges outward on the side of Earth opposite the moon. This is the first tidal budge, bulge. Inertia causes the riders to move outward as the ride spins around quickly. Inertia produces the first tidal bulge. The second oceanic bulge occurs on the side of Earth closest to the moon. It is caused by the moon's gravity. The moon is close enough to Earth that its gravity pulls the ocean's water toward it on the side of Earth closest to the moon. On the other side of the Earth, however, the moon's gravity is not strong enough to overcome the force of inertia pulling the ocean's water away from it. The two bulges of the ocean remain in line with the moon as Earth rotates around its axis. As a location passes through the fullest part of each bulge, the seawater is at its highest level. This is called high tide. It happens twice a day because Earth rotates through each bulge once in a day. During high tide, nutrients in seawater reach organisms in all intertidal zones. Filter feeders, such as barnacles and mussels, are able to eat and rehydrate. When the location is at the midpoint between the bulges, seawater is at its lowest level. This is called low tide. It also happens twice a day. During low tide, organisms must cope with air exposure and scavengers use this as an opportunity to feast on low intertidal food. Drying out by radiation. As the tide slowly drops, the shore becomes exposed to the air. The farther up the intertidal zone is, the more exposure an organism faces. Remember that the intertidal zone is the region of land that is covered and uncovered by water between high and low tides. Organisms that spend most of their time on the exposed rocks face many challenges. One challenge is desiccation. Desiccation is drying out due to the removal of water. Another challenge is extreme temperature changes. Most organisms cannot function in extremely high temperatures. Some survive by moving under rocks during the hottest times of the day. This lets them avoid the heat and dryness of exposed air. For example, many snails and crabs crawl around searching for food during high tide. They then hide under rocks at low tide. Their shells also shelter them from high temperatures and hold water to keep the animals from drying out. Radiation. The exposed shoreline is a harsh environment because the sun releases a huge amount of energy. This light energy reaches Earth's surface by radiation, which is the only form of heat transfer that occurs without contact between the heat source and the object heated. The amount of solar radiation differs throughout the year. It also changes from day to night. This is why it's colder in winter and at night than it is in the summer and during the day. Some materials also absorb different amounts of energy. For example, water responds to temperature change much more slowly than land does. This is because the ocean has a higher heat capacity than land. Heat capacity is the energy required to raise the temperature. In other words, it takes longer for water to heat and cool than the land. As the sun heats earth, the land becomes warmer before the ocean does because the ocean has a higher heat capacity. Conduction and convection. Once the sun's energy hits Earth's surface, it can be transferred to other substances through conduction or convection. Conduction is a form of heat transfer that occurs when molecules collide. When two substances have different temperatures, uh, two substances that have different temperatures come into contact with each other, the faster moving molecules of the warmer object give up some of their energy to the slower molecules when they come into contact with one another. The slower molecules gain more energy. This makes them start to move faster. 
Heat always flows in this direction, transferring out of hotter regions or objects and into colder ones. Adaptations to reduce heat transfer. Some rocky shore organisms have adaptations that help them reduce the amount of heat transfer that occurs between them and the rocks. For example, many marine snails produce a mucus around their shells. This mucus acts as a protective barrier when they are exposed to the air. This mucus helps to insulate the snails so that heat from the rocks doesn't transfer to them. Good thermal insulators do not easily let heat pass through them. Water is also a thermal insulator because it doesn't conduct heat well. Air is another natural thermal. Feathers, fur, and natural fibers are all thermal insulators, helping different animals regulate their temperature so too much heat doesn't transfer into or out of their bodies. Human-made insulators include plastics and foams. Marine snails produce a mucus that acts as an insulator, reducing heat transfer from the rocks. Rocky shore zones. If you've ever walked along a rocky shore, you may have noticed something that has long fascinated ecologists. The shoreline appears layered as you move from the rocks to the water. Each layer has a completely different set of organisms living there. Each layer is made up of different numbers and kinds of organisms, depending on how much it is exposed to air and water. There are four main levels, the splash zone, the high intertidal zone, the mid intertidal zone, and the low intertidal zone. Non-living parts of an ecosystem are called abiotic factors. These include air, water, and sunlight. Scientists believe that in general, the abiotic stresses of the environment determine how far up the rocks a species can live. These stresses include extreme temperatures and the risk of desiccation. For example, Mussels cannot live farther up the rocks than they do because of the non-living stresses of temperature extremes and desiccation. The living stresses of the environment determine how close to the water a species can live. These stresses include predation and competition. Remember how sea stars act as checks on mussels? Scientists have found that the lower boundary of where mussels live is just beyond where sea stars can live. Because of environmental stresses and predation, Mussels are typically found in the mid-intertidal zone. This zone covered by seawater for approximately the same amount of time it is exposed to air. Tide pools are often seen in the mid-intertidal zone. There are different levels within the intertidal zone. Many different kinds of organisms live in the mid-intertidal zone. Barnacles are similar to mussels. They glue themselves to a surface so they do not get tossed around by waves. They also are covered by shells that they seal shut when the tide goes out to minimize water loss. When the tide comes in again, they open their shells because they, like mussels, are filter feeders, so they gather energy by straining nutrients and small organisms out of the water. The most diverse zone is the low intertidal zone. This zone is nearly always covered in seawater, so it is teeming with life. There is much more vegetation, particularly seaweeds. Organisms that live here generally are not adapted to dryness or extreme temperatures. Sea stars are common here. Tube worms, sea urchins, snails, anemones, and different kinds of algae are also common. Kelp is one type of brown algae that grows in long strands from the seafloor. Instead of roots, kelp has special structures called holdfasts. Holdfasts cling to surfaces even in rough waters. Kelp stay standing in the water using air-filled sacs called gas bladders that act like inflatable swimwear. The least diverse zone is the splash zone. This is the area above where the highest tide reaches. This zone is regularly splashed by waves but is rarely covered by water. Very few organisms live in this ecosystem because of the harsh conditions. Those that do must endure the drying heat of the sun in the summer and extremely low temperatures in the winter. The high intertidal zone is somewhat more diverse than the splash zone, but not by much. This zone is only covered by seawater at high tide. As a result, it is very salty because salt water evaporates 
leaving behind salt deposits. Some plants are able to survive here, but not many. Organisms that make their home here have adaptations that allow them to survive extreme temperatures, changes in moisture availability, and high salinity. I learned a lot reading Rocky Shores, and I hope that you did too. I'll see you tomorrow with the next one. Bye.